will be done by this guy, uh, who happens to be senior manager at Pivotal. And uh, like Sean said, I'm growing my team. So I need really, you know, good open source developers. And if you happen to be one, if you know one, you know, be sure to send me your LinkedIn invite and, you know, give me your business card. So I'm also uh, an Apache Software Foundation guy. Uh, so as you may know, most of the new projects come out of the Apache Software Foundation. So different companies build their technology on top of the source that comes from the project done by the foundation. So I call you know, uh, various positions at the ASF. Uh, I've been there you know, for quite some time and I love it. I mean, uh, I, I could say ASF is one of the best uh, open source foundations precisely because it it, it has this model of you know community over code, right? So if you have a great community of people, you know, trying to solve a particular problem, the code will happen. Uh, I used to be, you know, I used to joke. I, you know, I actually used to have a T-shirt say, you know, saying "Root at Cloudera." So like, I, I used to be, you know, one of early employees of Cloudera, and you know, I used to do everything there, learned a great deal of things, and then you know, this little company, Pivotal, you know, came about, and I'm like, wait a second, you know, Pivotal has a way bigger charter. You know, it's not just Hadoop, it's this whole platform that, you know, the company is trying to uh, give to its customer base and, you know, now I'm a pivotal. Uh, used to be at Yahoo with the original Hadoop team, uh, used to be a hacker at some microsystems, you know, so I go between various different projects. And by the way, this slide deck is 120 slides, so I will try to talk fast, but too much partying yesterday, so, you know, you guys in New York have, like, awesome clubs, so, like, my voice is shot. <laughs> Uh, so, agenda. Uh, this will be uh, an unusual presentation for me. So, I will try to give you an overview of the overall Hadoop ecosystem, of the community of projects. Uh, I will try to talk a little bit about the history, about the future. I will not go into too deep of, you know, too many technical details. And on that note, how many of you uh, already have any Hadoop related project in production? Can, can, you, can you raise your hand? Say again? Uh, how many of you have Hadoop projects in production? Okay, not bad, not bad. How many of you know what Hadoop is or, you know, have a general understanding of what technology is? Okay, so I think you will get a value uh, out of this presentation by just understanding how the whole ecosystem comes together and what does it have to offer. And, by the way, we will also talk about how cloud changes, you know, the way Hadoop gets deployed and Hadoop solutions get implemented. So, if you think about Hadoop, then, you know, a long, 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 long time ago, Hadoop used to look like this. So Hadoop basically came out of the uh, project called Nudge, uh, which was a free implementation of a crawler, you know, something that goes through the web pages on the internet and tries to index the internet. And Doug Cutting and Mike Caffarella, uh, they were trying to figure out how to scale Nudge, so they came with two projects. So one of them was HDFS, Hadoop Distributed File System. This was basically the thing that would store your bits. And the other one was Netflix. Both of these projects, on the whole slew of secondary projects. And in the blink of an eye, we basically have something like this, right? Today, in order to understand Hadoop, no longer you can rely on just understanding of HDFS and MathReduce, right? You kind of have to understand all of the ecosystem. And that's what this presentation will be about. So the genesis of Hadoop is Hadoop was based on uh, Google Papers. So Google these days works as the uh, you know, laboratory for the internet. And, you know, uh, it's kind of like what Bell Labs used to be in the 70s and 80s. Uh, and then published, you know, these two papers in 2004, 2005. So that kind of implemented them. It was a sub-project of Nudge. But uh, the most important thing in the Hadoop's history was a huge bet that Yahoo, Yahoo Incorporated, made on Hadoop to put it in production as the basis of its internal sort of search technology and later on, you know, some of the other technologies as well. Now, if you think about it, why was Yahoo so interested in Hadoop? Why, why did Yahoo make this bet? Well, pretty early on, I mean, the Yahoo and a whole bunch of other internet companies realized that data brings value, right? You know, if you control the data, if you know a lot about your user behavior, then you can extract all sorts of business value out of the data. And to some extent, this is the theme that remains with Hadoop and Hadoop ecosystem to this day. I mean, we're all here today, let's face it, because we want to help our customers extract additional business value data, you know, out of their data. So data analysis by itself is meaningless. So data actually must enable decisions. Uh, every single time you pitch a new big data related project to a customer, I mean, I or you might get excited about the kind of technology we get to play with. But the customer asks a very fundamental question. 
how is it that what you are pitching me will change my business execution? What kind of decisions will I be able to make? The kind of decisions I were not in a position to make before. And these decisions could be automated decisions, so these decisions could be optimizing the website. So based on the big data analysis, you know, that's something that Yahoo used to do. Uh, it would basically lay out the website you know, for yahoo.com in just the way that was specific to you, based on your search patterns, based on your email, based on all sorts of interaction that you had with Yahoo. But it also could be uh, human decisions, right? It could be something like you know, predictive self-healing of an industrial uh, application, right? You know, if you have a jet engine turbine, uh, and you can predict when this turbine is about to fail because you know a certain component because you do all this big data analysis. Then you can basically make a phone call. You can you know tell the customer your engine is about to fail in you know two months. Do you want to fix it now or do you want to wait till it fails? So all sorts of decisions get get enabled by the big uh, by the big data. But at the end of the day, you have to enable decisions. There's also this you know uh, buzzword in the industry called V3, uh, and that's you know kind of like the three important you know, terms that you have to remember about what makes big data different from just data. It's volume, velocity, and variety. So volume means that you have petabytes. Uh, and let's face it, today, any business, any serious business can have petabytes of information just based on the customer interactions alone, right? You know, all the stuff that Walmart.com used to throw away because it would not fit into a relational database can now be stored in an unstructured you know, data lake and can enable Walmart to make way better decisions. Velocity means that that data changes very fast. So the kind of data that I'm talking about is the data that comes from all sorts of directions of Walmart, right? So it's tweets that, you know, customers of Walmart, you know, uh, basically exchange, you know, trying to talk about the products. It's the point of sale terminal data. It's all data and it's coming at you at the very, very high speed. And variety means that you don't actually have a way of designing a nice relational database for this data because the data changes, right? You know, you find additional sources of information every single day and you will likely be interested in those additional sources of information and you will start ingesting them. So V3. Now, uh, data brings value, but big data, of course, not brings even bigger value. So, uh, like I said, it used to be that most of the uh, Hadoop application we're optimizing sort of human behavior. You know, we were trying to make our customers, you know, purchase more products. We were trying to make our customers be happier with the products that we're offering them. But there is an interesting twist to the story. So in 2013, 2014, uh, GE, one of the investors in Pivotal, came up with this realization that they are now in need of a platform to optimize all of the industrial sort of sensor data that they're getting from industrial applications, right? And one of the reasons that they invested in Pivotal is, you know, partially because they want us to build that platform for them. So the relationship is not just investor, you know, investing relationship, but, you know, they also are MRK customers to us. What's interesting about it is the amount of data that you can generate from an industrial application would just completely, you know, make human-generated data tail in comparison. Because if you could imagine every single gadget in this room, you know, generating as much data as I generate online, that's the kind of uh, information or what we're talking about. And to GE, this is a huge deal, because imagine, you know, GE, for example, is uh, manufacturing a bunch of medical equipment, right? You know, so, so let's say hospital beds. So if you can stream every single bit of information from a hospital bed, and you can uh, analyze it, and you can build a data model on how a patient would respond to certain types of treatment, to certain types of decisions of the bed, then all of a sudden the beds that you sell to the hospitals have like a 10% higher, you know, recovery rate. Isn't that great, right? So it actually percolates down not just to you know something like you know, a big, 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 big uh, engine, but down to you know pretty uh, interesting human applications as well. Uh, so all these companies, all these companies are essentially trying to solve that very same problem. Uh, these guys basically need the solution that the internet giants like Yahoo and Google pioneered, but they now need the solution to be applied to their uh, businesses. Big data utility gap is something that, you know, we basically have this information overload and the giants, Google, Facebooks, and Yahoo's have figured out a way how to deal with that information overloads, but how do we translate it to, you know, GE, Southwest, you know, NBC, all these other guys, right? And finally, you know, big data is kind of like an interesting, in an interesting way, it enables, it enables all sorts of interesting applications, right? 
So when I talk about you know really business critical, you know very clear cut and dry you know, uh, business data and use cases, we shouldn't forget that big data also enables this, right? Uh, all of a sudden, it's a tool, and it's how you use it what determines you know whether the tool is used for good or for bad, or maybe you are not even sure. So all of it is enabled by Hadoop, right? So let's actually uh, take a little bit of a pause and uh, try to figure out what Hadoop is, how Hadoop has become what it is. So Hadoop is again, you know, to repeat, uh, based on two fundamental sub-projects, HDFS and MapReduce. So HDFS is a distributed file system, and if you think about it, what HDFS does is it enables you to store a tremendous amount of information on cheap commodity hardware without the need of anything specialized, right? You, know, you can just buy off-the-shelf you know, servers, you can buy off-the-shelf disk drives, and what HDFS will do, HDFS will take, take, take care of uh, data uh, consistency by replicating all the blocks that you're putting in, uh, into the HDFS file system, you know, your typical replication factor is three. Uh, so if, even if a single server or a single disk fails, you don't lose the data, and because it's a scalable storage, you can just keep adding the service with additional you know, disks on them and make the HDFS storage pool bigger. You don't have to reformat it, you don't have to change anything, you just keep adding this and you keep, 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 add, keep adding uh, service to it. So HDFS is not a POSIX file system. So if you are familiar with a typical file, you know, uh, NAS type of applications, you may be in for a surprise. So HDFS has certain limitations. First of all, it has huge blocks, uh, 64 megabytes and 128 megabytes on the common, which means that storing small files in HDFS is just a bad idea, you know, right from the get-go. Uh, it is optimized for mostly immutable files, so you, you write your file once, you may be able to append to it, maybe. You may be able to truncate, but even that is not, not quite, quite, quite there yet. Uh, but most of the time you write it once, it's, it's an immutable, uh, it's an immutable file model. Uh, it is kind of optimized for streaming data access, right? So when you're trying to read the file, you don't actually uh, uh, try to seek within, you know, the file offset. You basically stream the data to your application, and since your application most likely happens to be a MapReduce application, it means that the data is streamed in parallel from uh, all of the servers that are actually holding the data to the nodes that need the data. And since Hadoop is trying to optimize its execution in such a way that it tries to bring computation to the data, most of the time you will be reading from the local disk, but it's still a streaming access pattern. Uh, how do you use HDFS? Well, it's actually kind of like a file system, but you have to have a special client. Uh, so the easiest way is to run Hadoop FS dash something or other. And it's so different from getting, running your Unix command, right? Uh, there is a command, you run it, you get, a, uh, you get an answer. Uh, in Hadoop, if you happen to be on Linux, there is a way to sort of mount uh, uh, HDFS using Hadoop Fuse. And at that point, HDFS becomes uh, visible in your overall sort of Linux mount file system space. You can copy files in and out of it that way. But again, it still doesn't mean that you are working around those limitations that I mentioned, right? Your blocks are still big, your files are still immutable, you just have an easier access to it. Uh, in the uh, latest versions of Hadoop, you know, uh, Pivotal uh, PhD stack has just recently been, been replaced on Hadoop 2. So Hadoop 2 brings the capability of NFS access to HDFS. But again, this is something that may help you with an enterprise application if you want your enterprise uh, customers to have easier access to HDFS, but it doesn't take away from the limit limitations of HDFS. <coughs> uh, so principle number one, if you think about it, HDFS is that proverbial data lake that people have talked about throughout Gigo. So at Gigo, we have this poster, you know, behind Gigo's booth, you know, saying, like, store your data in data lake. And, you know, Guys would come to me, and girls would come to me, and they would ask me, like, what's that data lake? And the easiest answer for me, like, to give them is HDFS is your data lake, right? HDFS is that common substrate where you need to throw every single bit of information that your enterprise can possibly have and just let it be there. Don't ask yourself, you know, how to design a schema for it. Don't ask yourself, you know, whether you would need it or not. Just think about all the information that you're throwing away today. HDFS is the place for it to be. You will figure out what to do with it later. And I can almost guarantee you that you will figure out the applications that you couldn't even possibly dream today because you would actually have the data. You didn't throw it away. So 
At Pivotal, we have this vision that all of the data sources would connect to this you know, huge sort of repository of information. Uh, and you would basically be able to connect all sorts of BI tools and all sorts of analytical tools to that very same source of information as well. But not only that, you would be able to uh, seamlessly integrate your relational database, you know, sort of side of the house with the data lake side of the house. Because the typical model that you want to have in place is you keep all of the data all the time, you analyze the data and you build the models, and you figure out what is useful to your business. And at that point, once you realize what is useful, at that point, that bit of a useful data becomes really valuable to you. So at that point, you might actually offload it into a relational database, you know, for BI, for storage, you know, for safekeeping, you know, for Sarpan's Oxley compliance, for whatever it takes. But the two systems will always be coexisting side by side. So the data lake is not a replacement for a traditional uh, RDBMS, but it's more of an additional sort of use case in labor. It lets you mock with your data, but at the end of the day, you might end up storing your data in a relational database, and that's just fine. So if you think about it, all of these, you know, variety of sort of Everything else, everything else is on top of it. So far, I've just talked about, you know, you throwing all of the data into the HDFS, and that's fine, and that can give you some interesting results right there. But by the virtue of how the new projects have evolved, a very interesting side effect has become apparent. So, and hence I give you my principle number two. HDFS has become a substrate not only for your unstructured data, but for the applications that are running on top of HDFS to share their internal state. And what I mean by that is, if you think about your traditional relational database, it's a black box, right? You have no clue what's inside of it. You can, you know, issue a SQL query so you can get your answer, but what's happening inside, you have absolutely no idea. With most of the applications, pretty much all of the applications on top of Hadoop, they store their internal state in HDFS thus enabling all the other applications to leverage the control state. So just to give you an example, uh, if you have something like, you know, SQL type of solution on top of Hadoop that I will talk about uh, a bit later, that SQL solution will export it as a control state into HDFS and will enable your MapReduce jobs to be able to directly interact with that internal state and extract data from it. From it. So no longer you have to issue the SQL queries directly, your MapReduce jobs can actually look at the files, look at the internal state of the application. And that's actually tremendously powerful, because all of a sudden, you are unlocking the value of a single application for all of the other apps that exist in the Hadoop ecosystem. And that is something that is very unique to the Hadoop, not by design, but just by the evolution, by how the Hadoop ecosystem evolves. You don't really get it from any, any, any of the traditional vendors, because they all tend to be black boxes. So I will very quickly now talk uh, about what MapReduce is, uh, just to give you a taste for it. And uh, for those of you who don't know, MapReduce is a batch-oriented, you know, long job final results, you know, type of uh, application, the type of the computational framework. So it tries to bring computation to the data, not data to the computation. So computation gets, you know, parceled into chunks, and those chunks get pushed to the nodes that actually hold the data, and the computation happens on the nodes that data resides on. So that way you optimize for speed because you're doing local reads instead of network reads. Uh, it is a very, very constrained programming model. I mean, it basically goes in stages and that's all you can, uh, you can do with it. It also happens to be an embarrassing and parallel programming model. So if you have one of the use cases that fits into MapReduce, you're lucky. Uh, it means that you can go as parallel as you want. Uh, if you don't, you might need to look into other uh, suggestions that I will be uh, making throughout the presentation. It used to be, MapReduce used to be the only game in town, and there is still this stigma attached to Hadoop that somehow, in order to be able to use Hadoop, you have to write a MapReduce application in Java. That is no longer true. You can, but it's like, it's, it's an assembly language, right? You know, today, as an application developer, you can use an assembly language, nobody's taking, nobody has taken that away from you. You typically don't, because higher level languages are much nicer to work with, but you still can. So MapReduce uh, is based on the idea that you basically partition your data into records, and records happen to be key, val key value. Now, because we're talking about unstructured data, how this partitioning happens is totally up to you. So the first chunk of the MapReduce application is exactly that. It's a map. It's something that takes your data, takes your unstructured data, and figure out, figures out what is the key and what is the value. Uh, so keys, uh, for those of you familiar with Java, are comparable and serializable, so you can compare them, you can sort based on the key. 
Uh, values are serializable, so we can send them you know, back and forth. And logical phases that the memory design application goes through are input, map, shuffle, reduce, and output. So map, like I said, you take the data, you create these key value pairs, and then once you're done with that, that's pretty much the output of your map. Uh, shuffle, you basically take the input list of the keys and value pairs, and you sort it by, by partition. Uh, and there are you know, several customizations possible to do that. And reduce is you take those partitions, so basically you take all of the values you know, corresponding to a single key, and you get to see all of the values that correspond to that single key. And what you do with these values is completely up to you. That is the second you know, major piece of programming that you have to do for memory. So to put it all more in you know, uh, graphical terms, so suppose we are writing an application that just tries to count the number of you know, words, essentially you know, white space separated you know, letters uh, in a text document. But suppose that our text document is huge. Suppose our text document is you know, multiple petabytes. So obviously you cannot really do that on a single computer. So what you do with it is you create a mapper, and the mapper would basically be an extremely simple one, a brain dead one. So for every you know, word, like A, B, C, uh, you, know, you would basically just issue the number of times you have seen it. So A1, B1, C1, and that will happen on every single node, right? Once the mapper phase is done, you will go to the reducer phase. And what the reducers will see, the reducers will see the keys that are now individual words. So like it would see the key A, it would see the key B, it would see the key C, and then it would see the number of counts that you know, were produced within those partitions. So all that reducer at that point has to do is sum up the number of counts, and you get to see the overall number of times that the, each word was in your document. So all of that happens on different nodes. So the data is stored in HDFS, right? Different uh, mappers are running on different nodes. Then you have a reducer that is running on yet another node or a bunch of uh, different nodes, and the reducer's output gets to be put into HDFS as well. So as you can see, it's a very batch-oriented uh, model, right? You know, the time to run this application could be huge, but once the application is done, there is no other state but the state that you have in HDFS. Remember I told you that application share the internal states in HDFS? This is why. Because when the loop first came to existence, there was just absolutely no other way but to share your internal stages of computation in HDFS. The HDFS, at the time, was the substrate that was enabling you to do that, and there was nothing else that you could possibly use. Uh, so how do you use it? Well, you write the mapper, and again, for somebody familiar with Java, it's not really that complicated, but like anything with Java, it has a lot of boilerplate, right? So the guts of it are essentially here, so for as long as you have more tokens, you basically uh, you know, iterating through them, but all of the boilerplate that you have to do is a little bit unfortunate. But again, you know, Java has its nice benefits of uh, static type checking, so at least there is that. So the reducer would look something like this. Again, the guts are extremely simple. You're just you know summing it up, uh, but the boilerplate is still there. <coughs> How would you use it? Well, like I said, I mean, you would run it with the Hadoop command, and this is a typical, like, this is a real deal of how you would run it on a cluster of machines, as small as a single machine, because you can talk to run Hadoop in a pseudo distributed form with a single machine, to clusters that I used to deal with Yahoo, which were, yeah, like, you know, uh, 15,000 machines, right? You know, Hadoop would run it exactly the same way. Hadoop doesn't care how much machines it scales. So principle number three, as I mentioned before, is MapReduce is sort of the assembly language of Hadoop. But the good news is you don't have to use just that language. We move past it. So whenever somebody comes to you and says, well, but Hadoop is difficult, I have to, I have to know Java, I have to write all this boilerplate code, no longer. So Hadoop's childhood was an interesting thing, right? You know, like I said, it was just MapReduce and HDFS. It was pretty compact, so the entire implementation was just a single jar, essentially. Uh, it was a little bit challenged in things like single points of failure. So you would again hear it from your enterprise customers, well, but somebody told us that Luke has all these single points of failures. True. Two years ago, no longer true. Uh, it was extremely batch-oriented, again, a criticism that you would hear time and time again, well, but Hadoop is batch-oriented. True. Two years ago, no longer true. Uh, it was difficult for non Java guys. Same deal. True, no longer true. Why is it no longer true? Well, partially because this has happened. 
So this is the evolution of Hadoop uh, since pretty much not even the inception, because you know I kind of like cut, cut the slide uh, off. This is the amount of just innovation that happened with Hadoop and you know with vendors building solutions on top of Hadoop. This is the Darwinian explosion of functionality. I mean, if you if, if you ask me. So Hadoop 1.0 was this. Hadoop 2.0 is something like this. So what Hadoop 2.0 brought to the table is that HDFS still stays in place. HDFS has become way more stable and uh, reliable. So it's no longer a single point of failure. Uh, but the most fundamental you know, uh, innovation was Yarn, yet another resource negotiator. So with Yarn, you basically have this overall infrastructure of machines and things like metrics become just a particular application on top of Yarn. So Yarn is actually fully capable of running non metrics applications. And one of the things that Pivotal brings uh, to PhD, uh, you know, to the latest release of PhD, is an MPI sort of uh, type of applications that you can run on top of Yarn. So if you have an open MPI application, uh, you can now actually leverage your Hadoop clusters. It could be interesting, you know, to some of your customers, you know, who are sort of in uh, government type of, you know, HPC type of uh, business segments. Uh, the point is that no longer method is anything special. It's just an application on top of Yarn. So uh, how Yarn is different? So remember how I was explaining to you that Hadoop has this idea of, you know, mappers and reducers. So the way that it is all organized is that a client talks to something that is a single node in a cluster that is known as a job tracker. So that is a single node that you deployed and you dedicated its function to be a job tracker and there's just like not, a, not any other job tracker. It's like with a rifle. You know, there's many, many more like that, but that one is yours, right? Uh, and then you have the task trackers, which essentially are the nodes on which maps and reducers run. But the client always talks to the job tracker and then the, the job tracker orchestrates how maps and reducers execute. So at the end of the day, on all of the nodes to the left, you would see a bunch of tasks being executed, but the functions of every node are pretty, little, pretty fixed. With Yarn, the situation is slightly different. So Yarn basically takes the view that all the nodes are completely interchangeable. So when you try to run a MapReduce app application on top of Yarn, the client basically instantiates a copy of a job tracker somewhere in the cluster. No longer, you have to deploy it and you have to maintain it. Yarn will do it for you, so there will be an ephemeral job tracker just for the duration of your application, and there will be all the other nodes, you know, serving the same function. But for the next application, the job tracker could happen to be on a different node, or even, you know, within the sort of, uh, if you have two jobs submitted to the Yarn cluster at the same time, you know, you can get different job trackers on different nodes. So once that sort of like aspect of figuring out what node is now doing, or you know, what task within the application is done. The rest of it is pretty, pretty much the same. So it's basically the, you know, old style MapReduce application deployment. But the point is, from now on, your nodes in the cluster are just a commodity, right? You know, you can ask Yarn to execute just about anything on top of your Hadoop cluster. And uh, MPI is a pretty good example of that. So Pivotal has come up with a project uh, called Hamster which stands for Hadoop or Hadoop and MPI on the same cluster. And it's an open MPI runtime for the Hadoop Yarn. Uh, so Hadoop provides you know, resource scheduling and process monitoring and you know, open MPI pretty much does the rest. <coughs> What's also interesting about this is that there is a tremendous amount of legacy uh, in a good way. And I don't mean legacy as in you know, it needs to be thrown away, but legacy is something that you know, existed before. There's a tremendous amount of legacy uh, MPI applications that take care of your big data need, that take care of your you know, data, data analysis needs. So a good example is GraphLab. So GraphLab is a graph-oriented you know, analysis framework that runs on top of MPI. Well, from now on, you can actually run from the Hadoop cluster if you're using uh, uh, PhD. Uh, so uh, very quickly, you know, capture components are kind of like what I was showing in the uh, Yarn slide. So you have the client and you basically have the resource management uh, aspect of it. But everything else is just an MPI thing that will run as part of the overall MPI application. And unlike the FREDUCE application, the MPI you know, machines can communicate with each other. It's a very different framework. You know, it's not as restrictive uh, as Yarn, or sorry, as MFREDUCE. Uh, but it has a 
pretty steep learning curve because you know you really have to be a pretty sophisticated developer to leverage. But if you have one of the legacy applications, you know you can run. So this is what the two to the zero looks like, uh, and that's just the loop, right? You know, this is the stuff that you get if you download to do from the Apache website or from Pivotal or from any other vendor. The rest of it is the ecosystem. So the ecosystem, something that Yarn uh, and Mapreduce have enabled, is essentially all of the projects uh, that help you make either HDFS take onto new use cases or Mapreduce take onto new use cases. Uh, before I go into describing you know, all these bits and pieces of the ecosystem, just take a moment and you know, like appreciate it. There's quite a bit of stuff on this slide, right? You know, there's way too much stuff for you to make. So how do we make sure that we track dependencies between these projects? How do we make sure that we do integration testing? How do we make sure that we do optimization for the default you know, sort of type of configuration? Uh, how do we rationalize it all for the customer? And the answer to that is, you know, historically, you basically have to go with a vendor because, you know, the Apache Software Foundation is in the business of developing projects. It's not in the business of integrating them into a final solution. So whenever somebody tells you, well, I can just download the Hadoop from the Apache website, it's free, right? Yes, you can, but it's absolutely useless. Right. Because at that point, you're basically trying to replicate all the work that's happening within every single vendor. And you know what? I actually remember something like that. We've seen this before. We've seen this picture yep. before. This is exactly what happened with the Linux, right? So when Linux came about, it was just a Linux kernel. And it just so happened that it coincided with a bunch of GNU software being available. But it was kind of like, you know, this difficult hodgepodge of stuff, right? You know, you basically had to compile your own kernel, and you had to compile your own user land, and it was all inconsistent and incompatible, and the applications couldn't be ported between, you know, two different Linux distributions. So smart guys at Debian, you know, came up with this idea, wouldn't it be great to take some of that freedom away from you, to basically tell you no longer you can take an arbitrary version of the Linux kernel and carry it up for you, but what, what you will get in return is a very, very user-friendly system, something that you can just install on your laptop, on your desktop, and just use instead of smacking with it. Uh, what's interesting is, you know, the Debian has also enabled the secondary wave of uh, distributions that basically looked at Debian and said, well, Debian is doing all this integration, but it's not taking care of the, it's not taking care of the use case that we have you know, for our customers. So Canonical has come up with Ubuntu. Ubuntu is a very UI sort of centric uh, view of the Linux uh, distribution, something that Debian has no interest in doing, but it's based off of Debian. So it doesn't really replicate what Debian is doing. It just builds on top of it. Or subtracts from. Exactly. Uh, Apache Pitop uh, is trying to do the same with the Hadoop ecosystem. So we basically have the Hadoop as you know, a Linux kernel. We have Hadoop ecosystem projects uh, that we will go into details in a minute. They all come and all get integrated into Apache Pitop. And all of these companies at the bottom today are basically their distributions of Apache Pitop. Uh, Cloudera, Pivotal, Firstworks, Intel, uh, pretty much like everybody. So BigTalk has become the Debian uh, of the Hadoop ecosystem, and to, to me it's, a, it's great news because I actually happen to be one of the original sort of authors of Apache BigTalk, and to me having you know seen the project grow from you know just something that was germinating at Yahoo to you know pretty much every commercial vendor basing their solutions on top of BigTalk is pretty cool. And at Pivotal we're trying to be as aligned with BigTalk as possible. So in my previous analogy, we're like bound to sort of to Debian, right? You know, we're trying to be as close as possible, but we also bring some other additional stuff to the table, you know, when, when you get PhD from it. Most of the time though, if something is working with BigTalk, chances are it will work just 100 percent unchanged with Pivotal's distribution of Hadoop. So principle number four is uh, Apache BigTalk is how the Hadoop distros get defined. Why this should be interesting to you? Because if your customer asks you the question of, well, gee, but how can I influence where the Hadoop community is going? How can I make sure that my voice, you know, my use cases are being recognized by the Hadoop community? One of the ways you can make that happen is you get involved in Apache Pitfall. As any Apache project, you know, we're welcoming any sort of contributions from anybody whatsoever. So if your customer has an internal team of people, let's say, in you know, in charge of maintaining their own distribution of Hadoop, they absolutely should try and consider BigTalk because we will do some of the integration work for them and if they're willing to collaborate with us, we are more than happy to take their attention. 
But let's talk about the ecosystem now. So I've been, you know, giving this hints that the ecosystem is big and, you know, scary and, you know, you really should understand all of it. So what is part of the ecosystem? Well, all these projects, right? They might well just essentially start one by one, one by one. So there is a metric age base. A metric age base is something that helps HDFS take on to a different use case. So unlike HDFS that has uh, big immutable files, HBase has been designed to work with small mutable records. So whenever you have an urge to store a small file in HDFS, just say there is HBase and try HBase because HDFS is a poor solution for that. HDFS is a poor solution for that. HBase is a pretty good solution. So like any other uh, ecosystem project. HBase is keeping its internal state H files in HDFS, and you can actually mock with its uh, internal structure. I mean, there are people who do that. Uh, it is sort of could be thought of as a memcache key for HDFS because most, you know, most of the time it keeps all of the hot data in memory, so it doesn't really hit HDFS. Uh, so if you're working with a resident data set that is small enough, chance type will just fit in memory and you know you'll be fine. It's built on top of HDFS, so HDFS is where the data ends up. But it's also built on top of Zookeeper, and Zookeeper is how HBase coordinates within itself. Uh, you should really know about Zookeeper. I will not go into details of what it is, but Zookeeper these days is the fundamental building block that enables coordination within the distributed application that sits on top of Hadoop. So if you have to debug a Hadoop cluster, if you have to debug an application on a Hadoop cluster, chances are at some point you will have to look into an internal state of Zookeeper and try to figure out you know, what went wrong. Finally, Google's big table was uh, yet another paper that we all now benefit from. Uh, just like Hadoop, HDFS, and MapReduce came from you know, Google papers, uh, HBase also came from a Google paper on big table. So it's still available online, so if you're interested, you can actually go take a look at you know, a pretty good read. So what's the HBase data model? So the classical you know, use case that was cited, I believe, in the Google paper as well, is the web table use case. So suppose you Google, right? Suppose you want to crawl the World Wide Web, and suppose you want to basically store the contents of the pages, but you also want to store the links that you know other pages have to your page. So what you can do then, you can basically design your rows in HBase in the following way. So you would have the keys be the reverse uh, domain names uh, for the website that you're storing in a given row. Why reverse? Because HBase has this cool functionality of uh, you know, giving you sort of chunks of the rows based on sorting criteria. And if you sort based on this, uh, you know, you're basically getting the subdomains you know, of <coughs> the alphabetical uh, sorting. Then the content, each cell within each base, could be basically subdivided into you know, as many subcells as possible, but you have to come up with the design of what's known as uh, column families. So column families are, once you design them, you cannot really change them. Within the column family, you can do whatever you want. So in this example, I have a single column family called content, and that content stores the entire web page. This is another cool feature of HBase, right? You know, HBase doesn't care what you store inside of itself. It could be binary files, it could be photos, it could be blogs, it could be just about anything. Again, there are, you know, performance implications and whatnot, you know, if you store uh, too much data, and if your raw, uh, you know, key design is not as good as it should have been, but by default you can store anything in HBase. Now, if you look at two other sort of uh, blue cells that I have, you would see that those are essentially part of the same column family, but they have the actual columns being, you know, defined within that column family. So here, I have the column family anchor column family anchor, so this is the same column family, but within that column family, I have the column called a.com and p.com. And these are corresponding to the websites that are linked to the uh, www.cnn.com, mm -hmm. and within the cells themselves, I'm storing how are they linking to it. So basically it could be, you know, the content of the uh, href tag or, you know, something like that, right? So this should give you a pretty good understanding of uh, what HBase is doing. Now, how do you use it? Yeah. Oh, okay, sure. Good. 
Good point. Uh, so how do I how do you use it? I mean, the API is again it's in Java, so it's pretty you know verbose. Uh, but it's you know it should be pretty familiar to you. So you basically create you know something that is known as put. You know you format it somehow. You know you basically store a chunk of information that you want to commit to a single row, and you issue it. Uh, so the data flow model uh, for each case is typically that you know you have some kind of a producer of information that keeps you know throwing data at you, and you might store that data in HBase, and you know HBase will make sure to store it in, in HDFS, and then the consumer will fetch the data from HBase. Basically, HBase becomes your sort of current picture of the world as we know it. Right? You know, it's changing, but that's exactly what's cool about uh, HBase. It can handle the use case of when the records are changing on the fly. HEFS is much more immune. So when do we use it? Well, serving up large amounts of data is pretty good use case, fast random access, uh, and scan operations. So if you need to scan large chunks of you know row space, HBase is pretty good for that. It's also pretty good for just you know point queries, so you can query for this you know exact row key. Uh, but there are all sorts of other solutions that you know give you the same capabilities. HBase really shines if you have you know, these chunks of rows that you're interested in. Uh, so my principle number five that I give to you is HBase, you use HBase when you kind of need you know, a little bit of both. You need you know, uh, OLAP and OLTP at the same time. But what if it's just you know, one way? So what, is HBase a good solution? Ah, it could be. But within the uh, Pivotal Hadoop family, we have a solution now called uh, Geofire XD that is similar to HBase, uh, but has been designed from scratch. It's not sort of, it hasn't evolved as part of the Hadoop ecosystem. Uh, and it's a pretty well established product. Uh, what's cool about Spring XD is that it has been integrated into the Hadoop ecosystem now. So Spring XD used to be the standalone in memory data grid that you would use for HBase based type of you know, applications. But now it's fully integrated with uh, Hadoop, so you can basically use HDFS as a backend store for uh, Gemfire XD. And at that point, you get the best of both worlds. You get the persistence and durability of HDFS, and you, you, you get the uh, you know, transactional capabilities of Gemfire. So is Gemfire XD a better HBase? Well, you kind of have to you know, look at both and decide for yourself. Uh, so, first of all, Gemfire XD is closed source. HBase is open source as part of the Hadoop ecosystem. Uh, Gemfire XD is Pivotal's product. Uh, Gemfire XD, or Gemfire uh, for that matter, is based on SQL, you know, sort of object JSON data model. Uh, it is high concurrency and high uh, update load. You know, that's the use case it has been designed for. And <laughs> mostly for delective queries. Yeah? You know, if you want to get just that row, you know, it will give it to you, but there are no scans. So if scans are a big chunk of what you do, like I was saying, I mean, HBase would be a pretty good solution for you. So if you're interested in the benchmark numbers, I mean, typically, like if you run something like YCSP, uh, Gemfire tends to outperform, you know, HBase. Uh, again, if you need to determine which one to use in your uh, application, take a look at both. Most of the time, Gemfire would suit your needs. Sometimes HBase would be a better solution. Uh, latency is also better with Gemfire because, again, it has been specifically designed for this particular use case. So my principle number six, speaking between picking and choosing between HBase and Gemfire, the good news in the Hadoop ecosystem is there is always free implementation of everything. Uh, you could be thinking to yourself, why the hell is that the good news? Uh, it means I have to learn three things. Well, yes, I would agree with you there, but at least, at least, everything that builds on top of that will have good abstractions. So, because we have three different implementations for things like HBase, all of the applications that, let's say, sit on top of solutions like HBase will typically have an abstract enough uh, implementation internally to be able to migrate between, you know, Gemfire, HBase, you know, Redis, you know, all sorts of other different solutions. So, at least you would have this leverage of being able to try out different things without, you know, committing to just one, of, uh, uh, one way of solving your use case. Uh, so, as far as querying data is concerned, it used to be that MapReduce uh, was this, again, assembly language that you would get the data out of your Hadoop cluster. Since then, I mean, two other projects have evolved that become, you know, pretty dominant in Hadoop ecosystem. So there is Apache Pig, which is a non-SQL way of, you know, manipulating your data, and there is Apache Hive, which is a batch-oriented SQL. 
So if you're interested, like, why would you need any language but C? Well, let me actually give you an example of what Bing looks like. Uh, so this is, this is the big, big application. So remember that word count that I was you know, using as an example? This is how you would do the same in Bing. So it's a very uh, scripted way of essentially accomplishing a lot of data manipulation uh, tasks. So you load something and that loading is defined as an operator, right? You know, you then iterate over that stuff that you loaded. You know, that's a, yet another operator, it's called for each. Uh, you flatten, you know, the stuff that you got, yet another operator. So then, you know, something that should be very familiar to you as, you know, uh, people working with relational databases, you would do a group by. And finally, you would count, you know, based on that group by. But again, no boilerplate. Uh, no need for sort of understanding the previous side of it. It's a very condensed way of expressing what you need to do with your data. This is Hive. So Hive is a very simple way of accomplishing the same. Yeah, it's, SQL. Uh, it's essentially SQL for the batch, you know, analytics. Uh, it's not fully SQL compliant, so don't expect it to be, you know, to be able to handle everything that, you know, traditional relational da database handles, but it's pretty close to SQL. And again, here's the word count example in uh, SQL, in Hive. Now, to those of you who were earlier asking why would you use Pig, this is my answer to you, right? You know, maybe I'm not too, you know, maybe I'm not that big of a SQL dude, but this looks way more complicated than this. Right, you know, like... You know, mm -hmm. Uh, the question that, you know, you can ask is, uh -huh. is Oracle done? <laughs> no. Now we've got Hive, right? You know, what else do we need? You know, chances are, you know, the community will involve it and, you know, it will be SQL compliant, so, you know, like, out Oracle, you know, we don't need you anymore. Uh, no. Uh, so, first of all, I mean, nothing in Hadoop ecosystem ever has indexing. Why? Because Hadoop is all about unstructured data. Right. And in order to have indexing, you have to know Structure. what your schema is. You have to know what your structure is. You have to index for a particular schema. Nothing you can do would ever have that capability just because of that type of application. Now, again, granted, when I have nothing ever, I mean, take it with a grain of salt, you can do things like, let's say, free text search, and you can index for that. But it's a very, like, at that point, you're actually committing to a particular schema. Once you define what is it that you're indexing for, you've committed to a particular schema. You cannot really change it. Right. Uh, it's very batch oriented. So tools like Hive, they are optimized for really long running queries, and they're not really that good with you know returning your results you know very fast. But they're very good you know for queries that run you know for days. And I'm not actually exaggerating. So I have a friend of mine working at Facebook, and he analyzed a great deal of social information based on Hive. Mm. And his, his typical Hive query really shines because it takes care of all the aspects of what happens if my, my node fails. Well, if your node fails, I will resubmit that part of the application and, you know, that's your fine. What happens if, you know, uh, my disks fail? Well, at that point, you know, HDFS will take care of you, right? So for those types of applications, Hive and, you know, Hive being sort of a member of the Hadoop system makes perfect sense. But returning your query fast, not so many. And the metadata management is still in flux. So even if you wanted to exchange the views of your data between, let's say, Pig and Hive, so, you know, suppose you were ready to commit to a certain schema for your data, right? You know, how would you make sure that it is the same schema between a MapReduce application, Hive application, mm -hmm. and a Pig application? There are tools within the Hadoop ecosystem that let you do that, but there is not really a good default answer yet. So, uh, there are other solutions that try to solve some of the challenges, so there are close to real-time SQL solutions. And, you know, typically Impala, Hive, Tess, Solution, uh, and Facebook's Presto uh, come to mind. All of these guys are interesting sort of evolutionary points within the Hadoop itself. Pivotal Spock, which is also a SQL solution on top of Hadoop, is an interesting uh, counterexample to more common practice of just, you know, doing a bit of SQL. So Pivotal Spock is a fully SQL compliant implementation. In fact, SQL, you know, beautiful spot is a green plant database with HDFS and Hadoop as a backend. So if you're familiar with the green plant database, you should know it's built on top of Postgres. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's fully SQL compliant. If you have an application that's talking, you know, SQL to your uh, backend today, you can run it on green plant, and then you can run it on home, right? I mean, how performance it will be, it's a different question. 
different use cases, but you can migrate your application today. It's fully SQL compliant, unlike uh, most of the other tools. Now again, Facebook Presto is an interesting example of something that has happened to Hive, and Taz also falls into the same category. So Hive itself is evolving, right? So Hive is trying to take onto these use cases of you know being close to real-time SQL. And two of the things that you need to be aware of is Facebook's project where they try to redesign Hive and come up with something that would be compatible with Hive on the query side, but you know have a different execution engine. And the Taz project, uh, also known as Stinger, uh, that tries to provide a different backend to Hive. So instead of being based on MapReduce, Hive is now exploiting YAR uh, capabilities directly, which makes it you know much 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 easier. Uh, like I was saying, I mean, Hope is a green plant MVP database, uh, true and SQL support, and an HDFS storage backend. That's all you have to remember about Hope. Uh, it also has integration with the rest of the Hadoop ecosystem tools, uh, and these days, pretty much for everything that's SQL on top of Hadoop, that's happening through the file format that is known as Parquet. So Parquet is a particular file format that all of the SQL on Hadoop type of solutions export their internal state into, uh, you know, leverage HDFS capabilities. So SQL on Hadoop, it's available. Uh, if your customer tells you that, well, the Hadoop is not really serving my sort of SQL-ish needs, well, today you can say, you know what? In fact, even a fully compliant SQL solution is available, let alone all of the other tools in, within the ecosystem. Uh, these are the tools that you would use to query the data, but the next question to ask is like, how do I get the data to Hadoop to begin with? So let's talk a little bit about feeding the elephant. So how does the ingest into the Hadoop happen? Well, there are two ways. <laughs> so if you look into the projects that uh, exist today, you have basically a way to ingest the data uh, through sort of the agent system, and that is the Apache Flume. So Apache Flume has been designed uh, to collect the log data. Mm -hmm. So if you know what Splunk is, it's kind of like, you can think of it as a backend for Splunk, right? So it's like the thing that basically takes all of the logging from every single node in your IT infrastructure and stuffs it into HDFS. Since then, uh, Flume has been used in a variety of different applications. Uh, so I know, for example, there is a financial firm that uses Flume to, uh, as a message bus. So they basically send messages you know, using Flume. Uh, they send messages between the agents within their application, but then they deposit those messages into HDFS uh, as well. You know, how well it is performing remains to be seen, but it's a use case that Flume wasn't really designed for. Now somebody's using it for it, and that's just fine. But Roman, they're using it to record, not to stage. Not to stage, yeah, yeah, to record. They're yeah. using it as a write once. Exactly, yes, yes, yes. yes. They're using it as a write once, yeah. That, yeah that's, that's a different, different discussion. Yeah, yes. Far different discussion. Yes. Uh, if you want something that would take bits and pieces of data from you know distributed agents throughout your IT infrastructure and maybe even outside of your IT infrastructure, you know, Flume is a reasonable solution. So take a look at Flume. Now, what do you do if you have relational database within your IT infrastructure? Well, there is a solution called Scoop, Apache Scoop that was specifically designed to connect your Hadoop clusters back to the relation relational databases. And it goes both ways. So when you first appear in the enterprise, you have to ingest all of the existing data into Hadoop because the more data you can get into Hadoop, the better it is. So the way you do it, you use Scoop. It's essentially a parallel distributed extractor, you know, E in ETL, you know, right, a thing that would interface with your Oracle database or your, you know, DB2 database and just suck all the data out of it and make it available. It goes the other way too. So if throughout manipulations of your data you discovered some value, you can basically ask school to now push that data back into the relational database for all sorts of you know other types of applications. You know, maybe you have existing BI tools that you like, maybe you have some compliance needs, but it goes both ways. So Scoop is good for uh, pushing data into Hadoop and pushing data out of the Hadoop cluster. Uh, Scoop one was a MapReduce tool, so you had to basically run it by hand. You had to be uh, at least a DBA, if not a developer. <coughs> Two is a much more s of a standalone service, so you basically can instruct it to run, you know, on schedule, uh, to have a workflow management aspect to it. You know, it's a much more comprehensive solution. 
Scoop 2 is not really ready yet, so you know when I say Scoop 2, I really mean Scoop, you know, 0. Point, mm -hmm. uh, oh, sorry, it's type 1.99. Yeah, that was point, what was bothering yeah, me. Exactly, 1.99.x, uh, but it's coming, so Scoop will be there. Now, if you look into what uh, Pivotal is offering, so Pivotal is offering a different type of, you know, way of feeding the elephant, and it's called Spring XT. So, an interesting thing about Spring XT is uh, Spring and Spring Source, you know, are sort of something that Pivotal manages. And people are expecting Spring to be just a library. It's something that you leverage within your application as a library. You link against it, right? Spring XT is the first example where it's a runtime service. You have Spring XT running and doing something within your cluster. And the good way to think about it is that Spring XT is essentially Uzi plus Flume plus Hook plus more flies. So it's all of these tools that are ingesting and you know outputting the data in and out of the Hadoop cluster on a predictable schedule, you know, done as a single sort of service. Uh, it's a good alternative to you know three different tools. Whether you like it or not depends on you. Give it a try. You know, we hope uh, you like it. And you know, just to give you a taste of how would you use it, you know, suppose you wanted to uh, have a stream, you know, that would export the time into HDSS. Well, you know, you would have a deployed uh, Spring XD, so you would actually have to take care of the deployment of Spring XD. But once you deploy it, you know, you can define this pipeline, you can define this transformation in this you know, pretty easy way. And you, at that point, you have a single, uh, uh, single point of all these workflows to exist and be managed. Now. So if you look into this you know, slide that I'm slowly building, uh, at the bottom, this is the layer that feeds HDFS and gets you know, fed from HDFS. So you basically have the choices of Scoop, you know, Flume, and Spring XD. And there's also Uzi on the side, like a workflow management system. Uh, give it a try. Ah, I keep it. And you're out of time, so... Uh, but I have 90 more slides. <laughs> Okay, let, let me talk about one, one last important thing. Uh, so, so far we've been talking about Hadoop, and it's just like, you know, Hadoop evolves. In 2013, actually in 2012, you know, there was this really cool project that nobody quite, you know, was able to figure out, you know, how serious it was. But in 2014, it's now completely obvious that Spark <laughs> is disrupting the Hadoop ecosystem. So why Spark is so cool? Spark is a completely independent from Hadoop, you know, Apache Software Foundation project. And the cool thing about it is that unlike traditional Matthews model, where you basically have to go in stages, and every stage needs to output its internal state into HDFS, and once the stage is done, okay, all, of the these, all of the state that you created in memory is completely lost, Spark is solving that very problem. So Spark is basically telling you, why don't you create that state in memory and you manipulate it as long as you want. So if you want that state to exist for hours and hours and days and weeks, like that's just fine. It will be kept in memory and you will keep manipulating. Uh, very quickly, so Spark innovations are resilient distributed data sets. <laughs> it's a way for Spark to basically manipulate it and I will show very quickly uh, what it is. It is this, you know, these are the data sets that are distributed throughout the cluster. Uh, you manipulate them, you know, using parallel operators. Like if you've seen, you know, the operators that I use in Pink, these are the kind of operators I'm talking about. Uh, and these data sets automatically rebuild on failure. So you do have that protection if one node fails, all the data sets that existed in memory on that data node will be rebuilt because there is a lineage of how the data set evolution progressed that will be retraced on the new node to create exactly the same data set. Now, what that translates into is like, if you're relying on any kind of side effects whatsoever, that might not be your cup of tea. Yeah. Uh, it is a very interesting parallel ecosystem, and I will show you why. And it's also a solution to a multi-stage application. So, but let me very quickly talk about resilient data sets. So, suppose you are trying to manipulate your data in this particular way, right? Uh, what it really means is that you are taking some files from HDFS, that's sort of one resilient data set, right? That's the operation that you're doing. Then you apply, you know, an operator to it, right? You know how you got the data, you know what operator you applied to it, so you can always retrace that step. If it happened once, it could happen another time, it could happen 
multiple times, you know, depending on, you know, like, if that node keeps failing, it will keep happening and happening and happening, and that same data set will keep be rebuilt on the new nodes that are brought into this part of uh, computational framework. But not necessarily, if the data set is still growing, not necessarily the same result. <coughs> At the point when you lift the data from the HDFS, yes, if that state changes somehow, you're absolutely right. Yes. <coughs> so just to be clear, you know what parallel operators uh, existence for? You know, these are map reduce, sample, filter, you know, anything that you could possibly think of. These are the things that you can apply to your data sets and build, you know, this sort of hierarchy of the, you know, data sets that are distributed throughout your cluster. What's super interesting about Spark is that it actually happens to be an alternative backend for pretty much all of the Hadoop ecosystem. So there is Shark, which is essentially a cloud on Spark. There is Spark, which is big on Shark. There is Emily, which is machine learning on Shark, uh, on Spark. And, you know, this would be roughly, uh, you know, because a rough analogy to Giraffe. Uh, uh, not Giraffe, I guess Mahout. Mahout is a better analogy. So GraphX is more of a Giraffe. Uh, and it also has its own streaming engine. So it's a completely parallel universe, which is disrupting the Hadoop ecosystem pretty quickly. So the jury is still out, whether it will be, you know, this thing, or whether, you know, it will remain to be a parallel universe. But I would definitely watch Spark. So if you want to know how to use it, it's no different from using, you know, big or anything else. You know, you basically express manipulations, you know, of these data sets, you know, throughout some kind of a language. You know, Scala is a pretty good language. Uh, they use it a lot, but Python is also available, so there are all sorts of bindings available to you. But the real deal, like, if you remember anything out of this talk, remember this. Uh, Spark is the technology for 2003. I mean, this is, this is the interesting thing. Quick question. Spark is from UC Berkeley. Is it a part of Apache uh, Hadoop or is it something different that you have integrated into your offering? It is now part of the Apache Software Foundation. It was originally, like you said, uh, designed and implemented in Berkeley. But since then it has been donated to the Apache Software Foundation and all of the sort of like it's now part of the Hadoop ecosystem, just like Big or Hive or anything else that's coming out of the SM. So any vendor can take it and, you know, implement like integrated into the solution that the vendor is uh, delivering. Uh, there is no magic left. I mean, it's just an Apache project at this point. So if I go with Autoworks, I could still get Spark as a part of the Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So what's your differentiation? So all of these bits and pieces uh, that I was talking about, like for example, if you have a need for ingest and you know, outputting the data, you can use you know, some of the Apache Software Foundation projects and those you can get from any vendor, or you can use FreeNXC. If you need SQL on Hadoop, you can use, you know, uh, Hive, you can use uh, Presto, you can use, you know, all these other things, or you can use Hawk. So these are the differentiators that we're building into the PhD stack or into the Pivotal one in general. Uh, my favorite one is actually Gemfire, so I think Gemfire is a really capable product because it has been specifically designed for the transactional capabilities of the in-memory data grids, and it's, in my opinion, you know, way sort of ahead of anything that exists within the Hadoop ecosystem for that particular use case. Question? Yes? Simple quick question. What's the workload that would compel you to move from um, your existing Hadoop infrastructure to something like Spark? You can take, like, like I said, I mean, it's essentially a parallel ecosystem, right? So you, if you have your Hive application, you can move your Hive application. If you have your Pig application, you can move your Pig application. Then you, you can move it, but why would performance? Because it's part faster. Uh, it doesn't doesn't need to sync the intermediate results back into HDFS. It keeps manipulating the data in memory, and it typically tends to be way faster. I actually have you know some of the performance slides on my other slide deck, so I can actually show them to you if you're interested offline. But Spark is way way faster than you know traditional implementation. And I can say, I mean, Hive is evolving, and Hive's backend Taz is evolving. I just like I just fundamentally don't see it evolving to a point where it can really compete with the Spark. Program.